Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to see you all here. Um, I'm uh, Tom Wickman. I'm one of the members of the Mov Movement Disorder Group here at Emory University in Atlanta. We also have an HDSA center here, so we, I see uh, mm -hmm. a lot of Huntington's disease patients in my clinic, uh, beside a few others with Parkinson's and other things. Uh, so what you're here for is a, a session about preparing for late stage Huntington's disease. It's not exactly an easy topic to think or talk about. Uh, but uh, the uh, two of us, Dr. Meng and myself, will be uh, talking about this. So I start talking about the medical uh, aspects of this and social work aspects will be uh, covered in the second half then. Uh, before we go further, the usual disclaimers so that the, uh, the two slides we're ob obliged to show here, one of them is uh, telling you that what you hear here is generally for information only, so more specific information to your questions and to your case uh, should be answered by your uh, uh, providers. And secondly, please wear your masks even while you're, when you're here. Uh, as far as I understand the rules, I'm the only one who at this very moment should not wear a mask here. Everybody else should wear a mask unless they're eating something, okay? So please put the mask on to protect us all. So what I'm going to uh, introduce you to probably again would be uh, the brain changes that uh, occur in Huntington's disease and how that translates into uh, the different stages of the condition. Then I will go over the stages of Huntington's disease and telling you where that comes from and what that actually means, this term staging. Uh, uh, some uh, mention of general medical treatments. I picked out a few special issues that people with Huntington's disease are often or often uh, suffering from sleep problems, weight loss, aspiration is one of those issues. Behavioral problems are also, of course, a major issue. They will be covered in the second half of this session. And uh, at the end, I go over a few legal documents, insurance and care environments, and then uh, summarize, okay? So it will be a bit of a whirlwind here. So the brain changes in, in Huntington's. So you all know, obviously, that Huntington's is a, a genetic condition and that it leads to brain degeneration. This occurs uh, because there are proteins that accumulate in individual nerve cells that interfere with the, with the uh, function of those nerve cells. How exactly that interferes is not really well known, but eventually it leads to the demise of those cells. This occurs in many neurodegeneration diseases, so Huntington's is only one of many. Uh, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease have very similar global pathology changes as well. Uh, Huntington's is a bit special in the sense that there are, yes, that there are, yeah, sorry, um, changes that are fairly uh, local to the disease. So you see here this little area uh, in a normal brain. This is called the striatum. Um, this is from a normal, healthy brain of somebody who died of other causes. This slide here is from a patient who had Huntington's disease, and uh, this is taken after death, obviously. But you see that this area is grossly degenerated. It's, it's just gone, basically, in the Huntington stage. This is called the striatum. As I said, it's a major center in the brain that regulates movement, emotion, and uh, some aspects of cognition also, so very important. That's not the only thing that happens, though. Later on in the disease, there's also loss of other parts of the brain, including this outer mantle of the brain that's called the cortex. Uh, but also other areas. At the base of the brain, you lose the hypothalamus, which may be responsible for some of the sleep problems that patients get into when they have Huntington's disease. You lose the cerebellum to some extent, much less talked about generally, but also important, which is uh, involved in the regulation of movement as well. So many of the dexterity problems are probably uh, due to the demise of those areas. So that all happens, this whole degeneration aspect happens over the course of many years. <clears throat> it's a continuous process. So some, I mean, people have Huntington's disease from birth, right? So it starts way back there, and then gradually this disease starts to take hold, and then these uh, problems gradually worsen in the three main domains, so cognition, motor, and behavioral problem. Um, 
this is a continuous process. So breaking this up into individual stages is very artificial. This is, there's no thing that, that you wake up one morning and you have to tr uh, transition from one phase or one stage to the next stage, okay? Uh, so this is uh, based on a paper that was published in 1979. This was a paper on the uh, total functional capacity, this famous TFC scale, and they came up with uh, a staging uh, scheme that would assign certain scores on that scale, it's a questionnaire essentially, with certain um, uh, clinical stages. Okay, so they said this is stage one, stage two, three, four, and five. So what we're talking about here is really the stage five, the, the advanced stage uh, of the disease and how to get ready for that if it uh, should happen. Very briefly, what this in practical terms would mean in the early stage of uh, Huntington's, this is a stage when the disease has uh, led to movement problems, okay? So there are motor invol involuntary movement twitches, some loss of coordination. There's also some cognition problems, so beginning what they call executive dysfunction. So you heard, a, if you went to the, to the uh, uh, major floor session, you just heard what this means. It's a, a problem with planning, with the uh, carrying through of, uh, of recipes and other plans. So this is an important uh, dysfunction. It's very, very disruptive to daily activities. Uh, and here's the behavioral changes. So depression, irritability, and disinhibition set in during this phase. This is yet a phase, though, where people usually can still work. Uh, so they're, they're not that severely uh, affected by it yet. Then there's the moderate stage. This is the, what is then already uh, the the uh, second to last stage of the in the staging scheme, which is a severe, moderate to severe chorea. Chorea is this uh, involuntary jerking movement problem. Uh, a significant interruption of, volu of uh, voluntary movements and very important walking and balance impairments that patients have. So they fall a lot during this period. It's actually the most impressive thing that I see in the clinic that people start really having a very erratic gait. Um, often the gait looks way worse so, so they, than the fall risk actually. They don't fall quite as much as you would think they they would when you see the gait. But there's a significant impairment there. Cognition is still worsening. This is just a continuation of this. And the depression is also still very present and it's changing gradually into this other feature which is apathy. Apathy is not the same as depression. So depression is just associated with a sad mood, for instance. Apathy is associated as more of a disengagement from activities that you previously felt were uh, pleasurable to you. So this is a, is a different type of behavior. And then we enter the advanced stage. In this case, uh, there is a, a, a need for major assistance has developed. So this starts off in the what it would be stage four still. Household task and personal care are affected, uh, but in stage five, the latest, last stage of the disease, there's really the need for around-the-clock skilled nursing care <coughs> needed. Uh, on the motor front, the chorea is no longer that uh, relevant anymore, so this is not really in the four, it fades. But what really becomes much more prominent, much more visible, is a lack of dexterity, rigidity, bradykinesia. This is a term that's used for slowness of movement and muscle cramps called dystonia. Cognition is severely affected. Uh, what is very noticeable often is that the speech becomes more and more impoverished, so that people really have a hard time expressing what they want to say, and uh, the, the sentence structure is much simplified, so it's no longer a complete sentence, a single words or uh, two-word sentences, so this is a big change. And then other problems really uh, come to the fore, like swallowing problems, uh, weight loss is a big issue, sleep issues, as I mentioned. And death, of course, occurs at the end of this, which is uh, usually not caused by Huntington's. Huntington's doesn't kill you, really. It's more the complications of the disease that can do this. So aspiration, pneumonia, or falls are very common. i tell you a little bit what that is, actually. Suicide is also common, although this is uh, not so much in the advanced stage, really. That would happen happen earlier. Okay, so that's the staging. Um, again, if you have any questions about this, please just yell them out, I think, so it would be 
would be the easiest uh, or enter them through the app. I think that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? So do that then <laughs> uh, and we can address them as we go. All right, so the medical treatment of these various uh, problems is guided by the prevailing symptom that a patient has. So uh, if involuntary movements are in the four, there are a variety of treatments we have. The, the one that many people with Huntington's are on is called tetrabenazine. This is a specific, what's called a VMAT2 inhibitor. It um, essentially ends up making the patient just a little bit Parkinsonian, which means they just slow down a little bit. So that is what the effect of this drug is. They come in various flavors. So there's tetrabenazine, there's dutetrabenazine, this is Ostedo on the market, valbenazine. It's another one that is uh, on the way to become FDA approved for Huntington's. Um, then there are a variety of older drugs, neuroleptic agents. Uh, risperidone is the one that's currently most favored. And then there are some investigational treatments like deep brain stimulation can be used, very rarely used so for this purpose. Um, then if slowness of movement, so that's not chorea now, that is just the rigidity and stiffness prevails, there are other ways one can treat this. You can use anti-Parkinsonian drugs, you can also use muscle spasm drugs. So baclofen would be a, a typical drug that's uh, used for that purpose. They can help with these uh, with these issues. Um, depression uh, is treated with antidepressants. Usually, uh, in earlier stages of the disease, uh, cognitive and behavioral therapy is important. In the advanced stage, this is really no longer uh, a big uh, part of the treatment because uh, language has deteriorated so much. Anxiety is uh, best treated with antidepressants in my mind. One can use also Valium-like drugs, benzodiazepines. Irritability and aggression, again, same uh, general treatments. Neuroleptics are quite good for that. And exercise uh, is always relevant, even if the patient is uh, completely bedridden. You need to maintain the range of motion of individual joints. This can become really painful if you don't, so this is really highly relevant to keep going with that. Dietary support I'm listing here, I will come back to that. So uh, the patient lose a lot of weight uh, as the disease progresses. So uh, maintaining weight and providing enough calories, enough proteins is highly important. This can go as far as tube feeding and I will say a few words about that too. And finally, it's important to realize that this is not done by a single medical professional, so there are multiple people that have to be involved in this. We will hear from one of the most important team members a little bit later, the social worker, but everybody else is, of course, also, is also relevant. So let's talk a little bit about sleep impairments. This is uh, seen in a large number of people, 90% of people are said to have, uh, with Huntington's are said to have sleep problems, 60% say they're severe. What is meant by sleep problems is that they're really, the sleep becomes fragmented. So it is a sleep that is no longer following the usual circadian rhythm that we all uh, grow up with, but it is something that's gradually uh, falls apart. People wake up very late uh, or, you know, go to bed very late. They, they don't sleep through very significant problem. This is also important to address, actually, even if it's not uh, mentioned much, but it's important to ask about because the, uh, at least in other uh, dementing conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, treatment of sleep can actually help the, the, the severity of the disease also. So it is a, it's an important issue to uh, try to fix as much as it can be fixed. Uh, it's important to recognize that sleep can be a sign of other symptoms that need to be addressed first. So anxiety, depression, or even chorea may have to be treated first before you can really adequately address the sleep issue. Uh, why patients have these problems is not exactly known, although if you look at the uh, brain areas that degenerate in Huntington's disease, it's pretty obvious that the hypothalamus, the area where most of the sleep is regulated, is actually a part of the degenerative process also. Um, how is this being treated? It's treated like most other um, f insomnia, fragmented sleep problems and other diseases. So sleep hygiene is important, making sure that the sleep is actually, for one, it's enforced at, <laughs> at certain times of the day. So there is really a clear rhythm, an external rhythm uh, to, the, to the disease, uh, to the uh, sleep. 
there is also uh, the absence of uh, disturbing factors. So it's not too warm in the room where you're sleeping. There's not too much noise. It's dark enough. The television isn't on all the time. All of those things are important. Drugs that interfere with sleep need to be avoided. So dopa some of the dopamine antagonist uh, drugs that we use can do that, actually. So they're not good to take right before you want to s go to sleep. Some of the antidepressants are very stimulating. So Prozac, for instance, fluoxetine is a very stimulating medication that should not be taken late at night. So you really should take that if you have to take it uh, in the morning. Anti-seizure drugs can also do this. Uh, so important thing uh, for the physician really to go over the medication list to make sure that this is uh, not missed. Bright light therapy has been tried in people with uh, other dementing conditions. I'm not sure that this has actually been tried in Huntington's disease, but in uh, Alzheimer's disease patients, this is effective, actually. It's a good non-pharmacological way of uh, helping with maintaining a circadian rhythm. Finally, medications that um, you may want to use for this uh, the, uh, to in, uh, encourage sleep. Melatonin is often used, it's moderately effective. There are also some drugs that work like melatonin, only a little bit stronger. Melatonin agonist, Rosarum is one of those that uh, can be used. And then there are a bunch of uh, medications that are traditionally used to in, uh, lead to sleep. So, Valium-like drugs, sedating antidepressants like mirtazapine are good for this as well. Uh, how about excessive daytime sleepiness? Uh, not so much of a problem in Huntington's disease, but the two drugs that we use for this, modafinil and caffeine, just simple coffee is actually uh, as effective as most of the uh, prescription drugs. Talking a little bit about weight loss. Uh, in this condition, it's extremely common in patients with Huntington's disease and very worrisome. So uh, weight loss is a feature that goes with the severity of the disease. This was uh, is based on the Enroll HD study, uh, this little diagram here, and which shows you how uh, the weight, which is on the x, uh, y axis here, and uh, how, how that plays out over the age of the patient. So. Overall, the more severe the disease is, the more severe is the weight loss. So if you're just not having much of the, in the way of symptoms, you end up on this orange line. But the more, the higher the CAG repeat num uh, uh, number is, so the more severe the disease ends up, the more weight will you lose. And this can reach really worrisome uh, proportions. So it's something that needs to be addressed. Losing weight is not good in this disease because it's, it really deconditions the patient. It contributes to being bedridden and other things. So this is a high, of high importance can be addressed by a nutritionist to some extent, so they need to counsel you how to maximize your uh, caloric intake and uh, what sort of foods to eat to get the proteins up. Uh, of course, other things like swallowing need to be also addressed adequately. And that brings me to the next little uh, item here, which is aspiration, which is another very frequent problem in advanced disease. Aspiration is a is a problem with the swallowing process. So for that to understand, you need to kind of look at the normal swallowing process that's shown here. So when you want to uh, swallow something, there are two competing things uh, that, that uh, you need to uh, take into consideration. So you want to uh, breathe and you want to swallow. Both goes through the same back of your mouth here, the pharynx. Uh, so breathing. Uh, goes where the uh, blue line is here, from the nose or the mouth into the trachea, into the air pipe. Uh, the, the food doesn't, shouldn't go that way. The food should really go into the back here, into the esophagus. So when you swallow something, there are protective mechanisms that close off the nasal cavity and that also close off the trachea so that the food safely gets into the esophagus, right? And then when you're done swallowing, that whole thing opens up again, all those valves open up and you can breathe again. So this is the usual process. And here's a patient uh, who had aspiration. So in this case, they gave this patient a, uh, a material that you can see on a uh, x-ray, on fluoroscopy x-ray. And when that was uh, swallowed, this is this dark stuff, 
it actually didn't all go where it was supposed to go, but it also went up to the front here. So this patient really got its food into the lungs. So this is what's called an aspiration. It's very dangerous to happen uh, because it can induce pneumonia and other issues. The food is not uh, sterile, so it's, it's a bacteria in it, so that can really lead to significant issues. So this needs to be avoided as much as possible. Of course, you can treat it if it happens. You can treat it with antibiotics and stuff, but this is uh, not always successful, actually. So it's a dangerous thing to happen. So the way to address that particular problem is by uh, asking a speech therapist, first of all, to see whether it's present. They do this test that I just showed you. Uh, and then they can do simple steps, so in advising to use small bites, uh, reminders to chew, etc., to overcome this issue. If none of this helps, you can also use a feeding tube again, so a, P a PEG tube, which is percutaneous endoscopically placed gastrostomy, so that's what that stands for. Uh, this kind of peg tube is a tube that goes right through the abdominal wall into the stomach or better yet into the jejunum, then it's a peg J tube. So that's a little bit deeper in the GI tract. And with that you can avoid that uh, bottleneck up in the, in the neck, right? So this is, this is useful potentially. It doesn't, it's not 100% effective, but it is a good uh, step. Um, these t feeding tubes are, of course, they have a very bad rep, so people don't want to have a feeding tube. Obviously, nobody does. Uh, but they're also not as bad as they sound often. So the placement of these tubes is quite simple. Actually, it's done by either surgeon or a radiologist. Uh, important also to remember, so if they really don't work or you don't want that, uh, the tube anymore, it can also be removed again, so it's not forever. Uh, necessarily, so those things are important to uh, remember. The tube itself looks like this thing. Um, this is the business end that sits in the in the stomach or the jejunum. So here you see it from the inside. So you see uh, how how a surgeon would see this um, it is, as it pokes in there, and then you squirt the uh, food through the feeding tube into the into the stomach. So why would one do this? One is, of course, the aspiration. The other one is that the, you can feed somebody a lot of calories through this. This is relatively easy to maintain a, a good uh, caloric diet, so that would be the benefit of this. Okay, so those are the medical things. A very uh, few words about legal documents and uh, other things. So this is also highly important if you want to get ready for the advanced stages of Huntington's disease. These are the four documents that you want to have in place at the time, uh, at an early time of your disease, so at a time when you have full mental capacity to make such statements. So you want to have a dual power of attorney in place, a healthcare power of attorney, which is a specialized dual power of attorney where you refer specifically uh, to healthcare decisions. You give somebody else the authority to make healthcare decisions for you in case you can't do that anymore and an advanced healthcare directive where you specify what sort of actions you would like to uh, happen uh, towards the end of life. So those things are important, uh, all three of these, and a will in general is also important. This is not just for Huntington's disease, obviously. Everybody in this room should have this, and, and uh, this is uh, just necessary for, for all of us to take care of. Uh, emphasize, though, on the early uh, completion of these things, so you don't want to wait uh, until it's really absolutely necessary. The cost of HD, this is one of the most painful aspects, obviously, of this whole uh, condition. Um, HD is a very, very expensive uh, condition to have. Direct medical costs have been estimated in a variety of studies here, a few of them. Uh, there was a Medicaid study that estimated that uh, just direct medical costs are 37000 almost 38 thousand dollars per year uh, in the advanced stage. Uh, Medicare costs a couple years later were even uh, 56,000, so hugely expensive. Um, and these are just the direct medical costs, so this does not include uh, lost wages for the patient and the caregiver, so there is a lot of extra uh, money that w would have to be added to this to come up with the true cost of the advanced stage. And this has to be weighed against the available benefits. Uh, and I know that uh, you will hear about this later, so I'm not going to go deeply into this, but there are government-provided benefits. They're listed here. So Social Security, Disability Insurance, SSDI, Supplemental Security Income, SSI, 
sick leave programs, and a variety of employer-provided insurance types, so short and long-term coverage, catastrophic disability, long-term care insurance, life insurance. All of these are good things. Some of these things can also be added to one another, so it's, it's, it's really important to have this. When you are looking for, an, you, when you, if you know you have HD, you're looking for an employer, make sure you look very carefully at the benefits package that's been provided and choose somebody who's actually, choose a company that provides uh, best benefits for your case. So highly, highly recommended, uh, very important. Uh, always important to be aware of deadlines. So if you, to be aware of deadlines. So if you, if you uh, become uh, unable to work, if you enter the more advanced stages of the disease, you need to make sure that you file for these claims early enough to really get the benefits, otherwise they can simply uh, say you, you didn't do it early enough and deny the claim. And if in doubt, use a competent attorney. This is very difficult to maneuver all by yourself. It is almost impossible to penetrate and you need to have somebody who is actually knowledgeable in this. So this can be a very capable social worker, perhaps uh, or on, as an individual for you personally, it might be relevant to really ask an attorney. Attorneys are expensive, but they're probably really worth the, worth, uh, the money for this. So. Finally, a word about care environments. You will again hear more about this in the second half of this. Uh, there are basically two models, the home care and the nursing facility model. So the home care uh, means that patient stays at home, is being taken care of during even the advanced stages of the disease. This can work very well if adequate resources are actually available to do this, uh, but it can be extremely challenging. So I have many patients who I really wish they could afford going to a nursing home, but they simply cannot. So this is a, it's a really huge issue. Uh, if the resources are not sufficient. Um, if you can use uh, help, so palliative care, home health agencies, all of this can be very helpful in this. Uh, the physical space needs to be also uh, made for this, so you may have to do modifications of the home, you may need ramps, you may need a hospital bed installed, bedside commodes, all sorts of things that may help to you, physical things that may help you to uh, have a, have a uh, adequate home environment. Occupational therapists can help you to uh, modify your home so they can figure out what sort of uh, things need to be done to make it safer. And then there's the poss possibility of using a nursing facility, it's often the only sensible solution really to provide adequate care because it is so much care that needs to be provided. Um, there are clearly huge quality differences between facilities, and if you find a good uh, facility, you uh, need to make sure that the family or whichever caregiver is taking care of the patient needs uh, remain strongly engaged to really oversee the quality of the care they're getting. So final slide, how then do we actually prepare for late stage HD? For one, get informed. You also use your medical provider, social worker, uh, internet, whatever, but learn as much as you can. So it's great that you're here today, so at least you learn a little bit <laughs> about this topic, but this is just the surface, right? So learn more about it. Make sure you have a really stable and proactive medical team who helps you. Uh, and these are just some of the people listed there who will do this, but uh, just ask for additional help uh, if you feel you can't do this. So uh, hospice, palliative care is, is there to, for, to help with these things and prepare for contingencies early. So resolve those legal questions that were on this one slide that I showed. Consider the insurance issues. Make sure there is enough uh, money available uh, to, to help and uh, obviously decide on the care environment. This ha should happen at a time when really the patient and the caregiver is are both able to talk about these things. So you need to really discuss these things together to come to the best solution. So, so I will stop here uh, and uh, uh, we'll hand the mic over then. And if you'll help me figure out how I, I, I will. So why don't, why don't you go ahead and I try to. All right. Much better. I'm a walker. Um, I have been working with HD patients fairly a short period of time considering that I've been doing social work and basically geriatrics and medical social work for about 45 years. And therefore, 
I have been able to kind of immerse myself and have really learned a lot about HD in a short period of time and appreciate these kind of conventions and how involved the family is with the disease process. Unfortunately, with some of our more chronic diseases, that is not always the case. Um, I will be addressing in the late stages kind of three general areas. You'll just... I can just stand here, so you just keep going. Oh, okay. Just, you, you okay. Uh, of course, we have our disclaimer, but I'll be discussing basically three areas how the role of the caregiver changes, how to manage cognitive and psychiatric symptoms, and then when is it time to ask for long-term care or hospice care. Um, first, I wanna say that late stage and end stage, but late stage especially, is sometimes one of the longer stages of the disease, so just like in any kind of um, institution, they say discharge planning starts at the day that you're admitted. Well, this planning starts the day that you find out that you have the disease. And many of our families know that they have the disease before they ever go to the doctor to get the formal diagnosis because they have family members or they have other folks that they have learned about the disease, so they're aware of what's going on and they know, hopefully, to seek out help. Some people, that gives them an excuse not to go and get treatment. They say, I know what's wrong with me, I don't wanna deal with that, I'm just gonna go on. And, of course, that's probably not a good way of managing this type of disease, because it is a chronic disease. Um, some of those folks don't even get tested, so they don't know what their repeats are, but because they don't, they're not required to get tested at that point, unless they want to go into a research study. But some of the, the folks do want to know what the repeats are so they kind of have a better understanding of maybe where the illness is going to go as it progresses. Uh, but with the late stages, you have both physical and brain deterioration that gets to a more extreme point. So the person's no longer able to work, they're dependent on others for basically all of their care. Um, the late stages of the illness can last for months to years, and many times will be, like I say, the longest part of the illness process. It is important early on in the process to look at advanced directives. You can go on, I think, to the next one, yeah. Um, advanced directives and something called a post are a post in some states. There are about 40 states now that have these documents. And a lot of people have heard about advanced directives or living wills. They're in all 50 states. We're pretty familiar with those, but they may not be aware of a post. And I'm gonna tell you why it is something that's important, especially in the late and end stage parts of the disease to complete, is it is a physician's order where when you're doing your advanced directives, you're sitting there looking at them and saying, okay, do I want a peg tube or not? Do I want um, hydra artificial hydration and nutrition if it really gets bad, bad, bad? Uh, do I want to be put on an intubator, you know, to be intubated, to have a tube down your throat to help you breathe? You're looking at all those kinds of things, which that's also in the post, although it's much more specifically defined. And if you choose to stay home and not go to the hospital or to be on hospice in a facility, most of your public ambulance companies, if you call the ambulance, 
they have to do everything they can to keep you alive. That's their job. That's what they're by law supposed to do unless there is a physician's order. So this is where the form comes in. If you have a specific way you want to die and you're basically saying, no, I don't want to die in the hospital, I don't want to die in the ambulance, uh, then a post is something that hospice companies and um, a lot of families feel comfortable having that because they know they're not going to run in and stick a tube down their throat and get them to breathe in again and do CPR when they've said, I don't want that. So that's the reason I think a post is important. It, number one, it opens up the conversation, which you've got to have these conversations with your family. And now I'm going to step back a minute and say, why is it important to have the conversations? Well, I've worked in a hospital for a long, long time. And part of that time, about 20 years of it, I've been on the ethics committee. The primary reason we get ethics consults is because I have one group over here of kids and one group over here of kids and mama has been staying home with this one particular daughter and she's expressed, mama's told daughter what she wanted but they never told the, the son from California and they never told the daughter from Maryland that have all flown in and now everybody's at everybody's throat because there can't be any decisions made. And they're all going, you know, the physicians are going, okay, now what am I supposed to do? A lot of this depends on your law, but if you have a health care power of attorney in place where you've defined who the person is that you want to make decisions and you have actually discussed in the process of the disease what you want to happen at the end of life, then a lot of that conflict just goes out the window. You know, hopefully mama or daddy or brother or sister would have said to the other siblings or the other relatives, no, I really don't want CPR. I really don't want a peg tube. But they may not have. But if it is in writing and you have a healthcare power of attorney and the sister knows that, then she can do what you want, not what the son in California who's feeling guilty because he hadn't seen mama in five years um, <laughs> wants done. And that's where we get into it's so important to have these discussions early on in the process. Know about the disease process, but also know what your family values are and what your family defines as quality of life, not just quantity of life. Uh, some families really believe that quantity is all that matters. You know, you keep somebody alive till forever, no matter what the situation is. Other families believe that, no, you know, if I can't walk and interact with other people, then I don't want a lot of life-saving measures. So it depends on what your family and you believe and what you want to say to those family members that will be in that position of making these decisions because unfortunately in late and in stage HD, you're probably not going to be the one to tell the folks what to do. You've lost your verbal skills, you've lost your ability to really process these things and capacity for healthcare decision depends on your ability to understand the decision and to be able to understand the consequences of the decision. So if you've lost a lot of your ability to think through things, then you can't do that anymore. So your family members, the person 
Um, if you don't define anybody, it would be your legal next of kin in most states, but hopefully you will have defined a health care power of attorney that you can say, okay, this person knows me, knows what I would want, and will act the way I want them to act. Now, that doesn't always work out that way. I had one lady that I worked with for a long time in the hospital. She didn't name her husband as her health care power of attorney because she knew he would not do what she wanted him to do. She named a friend because she knew that she would do what she wanted him to do. He would have kept her alive for, you know, that was his goal and that was not her goal. So that's the reason I say it's important to have these discussions. And the post, again, I'm going to say is an important part. Find out if it's available in your state. Your physician or your health care team certainly should know about it. Um, and is that something you want to have in place? It is something that has to be reviewed yearly and signed by the physician yearly. Um, depending on the state, sometimes you don't have to redo the whole form for three years. You can just add the signatures at the bottom with the dates. But others, you have to review them yearly and have them in place. Okay. Hmm. One of the things that I really like about uh, the post and the advanced directives is it specifically addresses some of the issues that you're going to have with swallowing, with hydration and nutrition, and placing a feeding tube. And like Dr. Wickman was saying, a feeding tube can be a good thing, but some people just absolutely say, no, if I can't eat, then that's quality of life for me. I don't want to be around if I can't eat. And part of what you need to work with your team on is, you know, can you use a peg maybe to enhance your nutrition, not necessarily just stop eating. Uh, now, when they do, sometimes the speech therapist will come in and say, oh, but they're not safe swallowing, they're not going to swallow, you know, you can't let them to have anything by mouth. Well, that's not true. <laughs> Uh, that may be their recommendation, but ultimately you and your family are the decision makers. So you may choose and know the risk with your family that you may aspirate and you can get aspiration pneumonia or you could even die as a result of drinking and eating. But if that's important, then you may be able to use the peg tube to get more calories into you that you can't get with swallowing as it's impaired. Um, it's important to, in this process earlier on, to identify the caregiver roles in the backup plan. Caregiver roles, what does that mean? Well, most of us have the patient and the caregiver. But there's a lot of other things that have to happen to keep life moving. And as the caregiver becomes more burdened with extra things that have to be done daily, uh, not only just keeping up with everything, but maybe actually changing and uh, maybe washing sheets every day, doing all those kind of mundane things, but they still have to be done, it may be time to think about what other people can jump in and help with things. Is there somebody that can take over yard maintenance? Is there somebody that can take over grocery? Just They don't have to come in and change somebody's diaper, but they can go to the grocery. They're going to the grocery anyway. Can they pick up your stuff and bring it to the house? Um, being able to recognize that out there in your own family or community, you may have some resources that it may not be comfortable, but the reality is you need to ask. 
you need to be able to define what it, what caretakers can do, and they don't all have to be that hands-on caretaker. They can be other parts of your caretaker. Um, and your caretaker community, I call it. <laughs> you may need to have a whole group of folks doing lots of things. And it may be volunteers from church, it may be neighbors, it doesn't matter who it is, as long as they're willing to do that and be reliable. Now, the other thing is the backup plan. And this is a hard one for folks because usually we have a primary caretaker. But what happens if the primary caretaker has a heart attack or is in a automobile accident or whatever happens and they can't provide the care? Well, is there somebody that knows where the medicine is or even has a clue on how to set up the box for the next week when you're not going to be there? Is there somebody that has access to the bank accounts that can pay the bills? Is there somebody that uh, is willing to come over and get the patient out of bed and into the wheelchair and help them go to the bathroom and do all the things that that caretaker has been doing or doing in the day? You need a backup plan. You need somebody that kind of knows the whole routine and everything that has to go into that care, which means you have to define it, number one, if you're the caregiver. You've got to define all those things, and then you have to be prepared to teach somebody else how to come in and do that. And so if something should happen to you, God knows we don't want that to happen, but if it should, you've got that backup plan in place because it is extremely difficult for family to walk in and have no clue. And then they're calling the team going, what do we do? You know, we, we don't have, we don't know what to do. And, you know, there's so many subtleties to this care that if it's home care especially, uh, they may have all kinds of tricks that they do <laughs> to get things moving through the day that if they have not shared that with someone, then it'll totally mess the patient up. So it's important to have the backup plan. Keep somebody trained to step into your footsteps. Let's go on. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the cognitive impairment and behavioral stuff. If you don't take anything else away today, remember that dementia is not a logical illness. It doesn't make sense. It's not gonna make sense. Our brains work, theirs are not working. So you can't logic people out of dementia. <laughs> if you argue with them, or if you put yourself in that position, you lose. Every time you'll lose, I promise. You may think you've won, but then you've lost. Uh, it doesn't work. So remember, it's not their fault. Their brain doesn't work. And that's what you've got to keep telling yourself. And I find this is hardest in uh, husbands and wives because they have that pattern that they've developed over maybe 20, 30, 40 years and then all of a sudden the patterns are all changing. I mean, with me and my husband, I call it favorite argument in 26. You know, that, that's what, we know what that argument is. We know where it's going, we know where it's gonna end. Um, with him not doing the housework and me getting mad and going in the kitchen and doing the dishes, you know, that kind of thing. But with those changes, all those patterns are kind of gone. They don't work the same way anymore. So the person that has lived that long, just it's very hard to kind of grasp in our own brain that they're not understanding that they're not getting it, 
that their brain is not working. You can go, you know that. You've done that for 50 years. What do you mean? But, well, no. They don't know it at that moment because the disease is interfering with their ability to know that. And we have to keep reminding ourselves until we learn that it's us that has to change because they can't change, not by choice, but by the disease. HD is preventing them from changing. So we still have our brains, hopefully, and we can actually make that step to do something differently, to try to make it work. So don't argue you lose. Um, what is happening to them is just as real to them as, you know, if they see that snake in the floor, then that snake is there. They're seeing it, it's there, it's frightening. All those emotions are real. If you go, of course there's no snake in the floor, they are just going to distrust you and back away from you and argue back with you or get, their escalation level will go up because it's real. So it's important to remember that when you do have hallucinations, illusions, delusions, that that is a distortion in their brain that is real to them and we can't logic it away. It's not going to be explainable. We can do some things to deal with it, uh, try to maybe, if it's a snake in the house, go get a broom and brush the snake out. Whatever you need to do to reassure that person um, and to prevent maybe some of the things that were happening. Now this is where you get into a lot of some of the subtleties of light and dark because you will get a lot of the changes in vision and brain perception as lights change. So in the evenings you may notice they're seeing things more. Uh, they will be misinterpreting information that comes in more, especially around dusk. It doesn't seem to happen at dawn because if hopefully they're not up at dawn, but even if they are, they're more alert, they're more oriented, they can <coughs> interpret things better. But in the evenings, they're tired, they've gone, you know, even with naps, they get tired later in the day, and a, a lot of people call it sunsetting. That's what the dementia Alzheimer's community calls it. But irregardless, if you have brain disease, that's a bad time of day for folks. So you want to maybe keep the lights up bright until it's closer to time to go to bed and then start bringing them down. <clears throat> you want to make sure that the, the blinds are closed completely, not partially opened, so that the light comes in at angles or whatever for them to be able to misinterpret things. There's lots of little things you have to kind of look around your own house and figure out, hmm, you know, what can I do differently here? Especially if you see something going on afternoon after afternoon after afternoon. Um, when it comes to using medications to manage behaviors, I know y'all have all heard some of the other presentations, but medications can be very useful, but they do have to be monitored and they have to be compared to what other medications they're taking so that you can actually get the response that you were hoping for. And there's no, magic to medications. You can't say, okay, they have a hallucination, so we're gonna give them this magic medicine and the hallucinations are gonna be gone. Mm. Might work, might not. Might take three different medicines, 
changes along the way before you find one that works. So you really have to work with your medical professionals on what are the behaviors and what can, what medicines may help with that. Um, I truly believe that intervening on the behavioral part of it, of what's going on in the environment, is just as important as any medicine that you can give somebody. So when you're looking at changing what's going on, if y'all saw Dr. Manning yesterday, he talked about antecedents and behaviors and consequences. Well, that's not what I call it. <laughs> I'm a, kind of the queen of let's get real here. I call it a behavioral autopsy. When you've got a behavior that you absolutely, they're in the middle of the crisis, you finally get through with the crisis, you need to go back and do a behavioral autopsy. What was going on prior to the behavior? What led up and caused, hopefully we can identify, what caused that behavior? Or if there was nothing, then that gives you information. But you need to look at the little bitty things like the lights, or did the phone ring, or did you answer the phone in the other room and they thought you were talking about them behind your back? Uh, did the kids, grandkids come over, or the nieces and nephews earlier in the day and they were really busy and all of a sudden they got too tired? Um, they, you know, and by the time the behavior actually occurred, you may have forgotten all about the grandkids coming or the nieces and nephews coming. So it's important to look at kind of for several hours back what has been going on that led up to that and what can I do to change what was going on or how it was going on so we can prevent that behavior in the future or at least modify it. So I think that's really important and it's something that takes kind of some practice to do. You've got to, number one, remember to do it. Once you're through with the crisis, usually you're so tired you're going, oh, thank God that's over. You know, let's just go to bed. But <laughs> go back and try to at least the next day see if you can think about. But it's also important to walk the environment that they were in, maybe something in that environment, maybe now an issue, like I say, whether the shades were drawn or not when they're usually the opposite. Um, was it cold? Was it hot? Was the TV too loud? Was the, there also a TV going in the kitchen when they were watching the one in the den and there was that competing noise that all of a sudden they can't figure out how to deal with. There's lots of things that we can look at in our own environment that may be able to help folks focus. And as we've talked about many times with the brain aspect of it, being able to focus and pay attention and communicate are extremely important. So that's part of what we're dealing with. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. There are a lot more things, obviously, that can be done with behavioral and cognitive management. And it's something that I strongly advise that you, there's several publications on the dementia aspect of it. HDSA has excellent uh, publications available. Uh, there's a lot out there, even in the dementia community, but I will tell you where I have learned the majority of what I have learned, and that's from support groups. Sharing what you know has worked for this one May not work for this one, but you can at least try it. You've got some ideas. You're not 
amazed when something happens because you've heard that it's happened before. So support groups are extremely important from the standpoint of you're the, the caregiver, you need that support. You need to be able to say, this is driving me crazy. And everybody going, yeah, we understand, not, oh, you know, why are you talking like that? Um, but there comes a time when you're talking about when is it time to look at either long-term care or hospice care. Um, long-term care versus hospice care. Hospice care can be either in the home or in a residential facility. It's not necessarily just in a facility. Uh, and it can even be in a long-term care facility if it is a situation where, like in the state of Mississippi, if you choose to not have a feeding tube, but yet you're no longer safe swallowing, then the long-term care has to call in hospice because their loss, the requirements for the State Department of Health says that you have to provide adequate nutrition to anybody you serve. So if you're not offering them adequate nutrition because they choose not to have a peg tube, then you have to have an alternate, which is hospice care. Uh, if you're at home, then hospice can actually add some additional layers of support for you uh, and even send in an aide two or three times a week to help you change the bed and get the person dressed and get them out of bed and give you a little break of that day-to-day -day kinds of things too. But hospice has a lot of criteria <laughs> and you have to meet a bunch of criteria according to the Medicare standards and even if you don't have Medicare, your insurance company may in fact um, have a hospice criteria on top of the Medicare standards. So it's important as the disease is progressing and maybe they're in a wheelchair or they have no longer swallowing. Anyway, you, you can see the deterioration coming to let hospice do an evaluation. Even though they may not be at the end of life right then, that's not the criteria for hospice. Hospice criteria by Medicare standards is in the normal course of the disease, they will die within six months. But that's not an absolute. That can be extended even to a year. As long as they're not getting better, as long as they're getting work, they're deteriorating, then they can stay on hospice criteria. But hospice can come in, and even if they're not eligible for hospice at that particular time, they can tell you what needs to happen or what the next step is, so you know what to look for to be able to call them back and say, okay, I think we're there now. Can you come in and help? So even earlier in the process, in the learning process, you may want to ask hospice to come in and give you that information of what criteria you're looking for. So we should um, probably uh, summarize since there are a couple of questions. Okay. Long-term care, that's a pain in the butt for most people in most states. Finding a facility that's willing to accept an HD patient. I will tell you in our center of excellence, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to not only refer to facilities, but in part of the referral to the facility, we offer in service to the facility staff to, on how to deal with an HD patient. Because of course the first thing they do is say, well, no, we can't manage that patient. Well, they're not really any different from managing any other long-term care patient. They just 
the staff needs to understand the behaviors and what's going on so they can manage it better. Um, okay, let's see. Always plan on long-term care, even though you may have said all your life, no, we're gonna keep them at home forever. You always plan for long-term care because it may happen whether you that's your want to or not. So know the resources, speak to an elder attorney or a disability attorney, someone that has expertise in being able to help you manage your finances way back here, long before you get over here, because when you get over here, then you may have a problem because you can't switch monies around at the last minute. But you may be able to plan maybe early in the disease process and put the savings in your name, not in their name, or you know, put the house in your name, not their name. And in most states, if, it, if there's any transfer of property or monies, as long as it's been five years and one month, then they can't hold that against you. So, but you wanna plan it back here, not wait till the last minute. Okay. We have had a few questions come through. The first one is, what are the cost differences between late stage care home versus a facility? Late stage what? Home versus a facility. Okay, what's the cost difference between home care and long-term care? A lot of that depends on planning. If you have a long-term care insurance plan, you may be able to get in-home care or long-term care. It depends on what kind of plan you chose and what kind of benefits they have. But cost-wise, you've got to be available regardless. The caretaker still needs to be just as involved with care, whether they're in a long-term care facility or they're at home. But in long-term care facilities, most people you're going to be looking at, there's a day rate for nursing homes, um, which can range anywhere from $200 to $500 a day, depending on what part of the country that you're in. Uh, when you look at 24-hour sitter service, if you've got to have that type of support, that's a tremendous amount. In my area, sitters are 20 to $22 an hour for 24 hours. That adds up real quick. So you kind of want to look at, you know, where can I plug up? Maybe I don't need somebody 24 hours. Maybe I only need them the eight at night so I can get a decent night's sleep. Um, and or maybe there's a niece or a nephew looking for a little bit of extra change that can come over and spend the night and help. Those kinds of things you look at all the way around, but the cost is significant when you get into long-term care. Now, most states, in fact, all states, uh, have Medicaid eligibility for long-term care and that is something to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself early with what that criteria is. What are the cutoffs? You know, a spouse can have $100,000 in assets in Mississippi, and Mississippi's a poor state. So <laughs> I can imagine in some other states it's much higher. Uh, and they can't count your house against you, and they can't count your car against you, because your spouse still has to survive. So it's the kind of thing that get educated early on, ask questions. What do I need to do? Could you explain a little bit what you meant by knowing where the CAG repeats are and how that determines impact? Yeah, I, so the CAG repeats are part of the gene that is mutated, okay? 
So the CAG repeat number is the number, it is a measure of the severity of the disease. It essentially dictates how fast it will progress. If it uh, is a low number, that would be numbers between below 40, I would say. The disease is quite slow. If it is a higher number, the disease will progress faster. And that will manifest then as an earlier onset of the disease and a faster progression. So both things go together. And with that CAG repeat number, the severity number, a lot of other things co-vary with that. They come along with that. So things like what I said, the sleep disorders uh, are an example of that. The weight loss is another example of that. The cognition decline is an example of that. So all of that is dictated by this, by the severity of the mutation. Uh, again, that mutation is there all lifelong. So it's not, it doesn't start at the moment you have the disease or it shows the first symptoms. It's there all the time. So it, this progresses really from the moment of uh, conception to the to death, essentially. So it's a, it's a continuous process in that gene. That gene is also part of every cell of the body, really. So it's not just the brain; it's everywhere. Um, there's a, a question that came in both kind of both ways. So. Um, Kind of just the commentary is that many times people do not follow advanced directives when the time comes, um, where family members may not follow it. But on the flip side, um, if the HD patient cannot make good decisions, how, how can you follow their directive at the end of life? I strongly advise that the advanced directives, the post, whatever, be placed in the electronic records of your facility. Uh, you have them with your doctor and on their, they know they're there. They know what you want. That will help when that time comes and the family member which, you know, nobody's ready to give somebody up. I mean, that's a reality. We don't want to let them go. We love them. But if you've got your team behind you saying, this is what they would want, this is what they've said they want, you, that you can help that family through that process of doing what the patient really expressed. Uh, if you truly think that it's somebody that is not going to follow your advanced directives, then you need to choose someone else. Uh, but I think it's important for the team to know and to know when you're in that situation, you know, it's okay to call your um, neurologist or the social worker that you've been dealing with when you're in the ER if you need them. You know, get hold of them then. Don't wait two and a half days later when everything's all up in the air and go, oh, I, you know, I also tell people, keep a copy of your, a copy is just as good as the original of advanced directives and post. Keep one in the pocket of the car. Keep one available. They don't do anybody any good in the lockbox. You know, with the post, you want to keep one by the door. So if the ambulance drivers come in, it's there. You know where it is. So those are just kind of practical, down-to-earth kinds of things to think about. How do you make it all work? So one, I agree with the availability of the uh, advanced directives, absolutely essential. Also treat this as a living document. So people change their mind about what they want actually at the moment when they, they face these severe conditions and what was right two years ago may no longer be right for you. So uh, discuss, keep talking about these things. Don't just make the advanced directives and then put them somewhere and forget about them. It's important to keep this uh, at the front of your mind. And that's the reason the post is done every year, yeah. is so it can be updated. Um, another question says, usually the HD patient will lash out against the primary caregiver the most. Do you have any good suggestions on how to manage that? They lash out against the primary, well, yeah, that's the safest person. Yeah, they know they're not gonna go anywhere. So if they're gonna get mad, they're gonna get mad at the primary caregiver. Um, How do you deal with 
Well, for one thing, you have to just basically sometimes go to the other room. When you know they're deciding to have a hissy fit, a tantrum, whatever you want to call it. Uh, sometimes the best thing you can do is not be within their sight line at that point. Uh, being able to say to them, you know, if they're really angry at something to say, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm really sorry you feel that way. <laughs> not, I didn't do that. Um, it's recognizing they have the right to those emotions. You know, I'm, I understand that you're really angry right now, so I think the best thing I can do is maybe just give you a little time. Uh, it takes patience. When well, you're trying to negotiate with somebody who has Huntington disease mm -hmm. that we said earlier here, uh, it's probably somebody that you can't really deal with very well. You're not negotiating. You're telling them that you're not going to be in the room for a little while. You're giving them information. But, yeah, negotiating doesn't necessarily work. But just saying, okay, I'm not, I'm not handling this too well. And it's okay to say, I'm not handling this too well. I need to get away. Um, and you may have to go away and <laughs> go to the bathroom, and turn on the shower, and scream yourself. Uh, and that's okay too. But don't put yourself in a position to where you're escalating the behavior. That's the main thing. And if you're arguing back or you're trying to keep doing the same thing that you were just doing that they're getting mad about, then it's just going to escalate. It's hard. It's real hard. I have one final question, and it is, what symptoms will the patient display to inspire a doctor to prescribe risperidone? Yeah, risperidone is an interesting drug, actually. So it, it, it's fine. It should work. Uh, risperidone works similar to the tetrabenazine in many ways. So the symptoms that I would inspire me to prescribe risperidone is that they cannot afford tetrabenazine. So tetrabenazine is hugely expensive in most cases, and and often to the point that it's simply not affordable for the patient, and risperidone is a great choice. Risperidone has some other uh, features that come with it that are uh, good, uh, so it can help with these behavioral outburst irritability, so it's good for that. Uh, and it is f quite sedating, so if there are actually really sleep problems, that can also sometimes be treated with doses of risperidone. But again, the primary reason to use it is simply because it's cheap. Thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate your attention and your being here. I'm doing a support group next, so if you want to come to that, you're more than welcome. <laughs>